Good morning, and welcome to the morning concert. If you're not already awake, I'm sure you are after that. We've just heard the opening choruses from the Carmina Burana by Carl Orff. And it is my particular pleasure to welcome to the studio this morning the director of the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, Vance George. We've just heard this opening, the opening of this recording of the Carmina Burana, which won a Grammy this year for the best classical recording. And we're going to speak with Mr. George about this particular recording. We're going to play several others from the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, some music by Brahms and some music by Greek. Good morning. Nice to have you here. Good morning, Terry. Great to be here. Many people saw you on national television a few months ago when you accepted the Grammy Award for the San Francisco Symphony Chorus and Orchestra. That had to be a great thrill. Um, yeah, it was <laughs> I would say it went beyond thrill. It was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty terrifying, actually. I don't think I've ever, ever experienced more adrenaline coursing through my body at, at any given moment. Uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And, and there, were, there were lots of people. I can't tell you how many people... Um, uh, either had the sound turned down or just tuned in right at that moment and saw me. And I mean, I, I uh, got uh, uh, faxes from Hawaii, letters from Europe. I mean, lots of friends, students, uh, former uh, acquaintances, you know, calling and, and uh, saying hello and congratulating me and so forth. It was, it was, um, it was a wonderful thing to to have happen. And specifically, I think for for uh, for the arts at this point in our economy. It's a wonderful kind of pointing uh, to uh, something that, that usually is, is only awarded off the air in the afternoon. You see this, this still in the evening um, uh, shown while well, the, the, you know, the, uh, the best choral award was given in the afternoon. And because they could make a, a um, production number out of it, uh, they made the production number out of the, out of the Hallelujah Chorus, sung as the Hallelujah Chorus, and then the, the crossover with the gospel group coming in halfway through. That's why uh, the uh, Chorus Award was made on national tel television to 1.5 billion people. Right. Billion. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even think. I mean. It's nice to see that music celebrated in the same way that the, the popular music, where you have all the money in the world to produce. Right. And, uh, nice to see publicly awarded all the fine work yeah. that uh, you and uh, Thank Monsieur you. Blumstedt Thank have you. done yes. here with, with, with our local symphony. Tell us a little bit about this work, Carmina Burana. It's a work that many people are familiar with. They, if they don't know the whole work, they've heard these opening choruses. Right. They've been used or abused as uh, theme music, from everything from theme music to mayonnaise ads. But there, there's a good deal more to the work than just that. Yeah, it, it's been used as a lot of uh, a lot of background music for movies. Um, but it. Uh, and in, in going into this recording, I, I really went back to the piece as though I were doing it for the very first time. And uh, it was interesting to just try to rediscover what the texts were about, I mean, I, I, uh, and also uh, what Orff's particular approach was. Um, the texts are actually um, um, poetry on fate, uh, love, uh, by I would uh, sort of the, the the hippies of uh, of uh, you know the, the uh, 1200s or uh, so the Goliards the the wandering uh, scholars the, the musically what was what's interesting for me is that uh, Orff is very often uh, given a, a, a rather um, bum rap in that he uh, is compared to Stravinsky and what every composer tries to do in in a new work is to re discover something in the art that is totally new. And uh, Orff specifically just tried to reinvent music as though he had never heard a note, and Carmina Burana is the result. It actually is a part of a trilogy. Uh, Carmina Burana, uh, Catuli Carmina is the second act, and then the third act is Triunfo di Aphrodite. And they're presented in Munich in, in their original form, which is a, a kind of pageant, ballet, dance, song, orchestra, and so forth, and takes about three hours in performance. Mm -hmm. Has that third section been recorded? I know there is a recording of the second section. I'm sure it has, has at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah, it's probably out of print now, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Carmina is the only one that ever really caught on. 
We're going to go now to a section, actually the very final section of the work. We heard the beginning. We might as well go in the, in, in hear the end. Tell us mm -hmm. about what we're going to be hearing at this point. Well, let's see. This one is very. This one gets to the love stuff right away. Si puer kumbuelola. It's a baritone and, and the men. And the text is: If a boy with a girl tarries in little in a little room, happy is their coupling. Love rises up, and between them, prudery is driven away. An ineffable game begins in their limbs, arms, and legs. Lips. Sounds like the Song of Solomon. Um, and then we hear a chorus, uh, Veni, 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 yes, uh, come, come, do not let me die. Uh, then some nonsense words. Beautiful is your face, the gleam of your eye, your braided hair, so, you know, that kind of thing. Then a wonderful uh, solo in Trutina. In the wavering balance of my feelings set against each other, lascivious love and modesty. But I choose what I see and submit my neck to the yoke. I yield to the sweet yoke. Then we go on to the next movement, which is um, for soprano and baritone solos and, and, the, uh, and the boys' chorus, children's chorus. Uh, this is a joyful time, O oh maidens, rejoice. Uh, young men, women, oh, 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 burning love. And then um, Dulcissime, which is a fabulous soprano solo. Sweetest one, ah, I give myself to you totally. So you see, it's all, all love stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and if that doesn't entice the listeners, I don't know what will. Here now are the final movements from the Carmina Burana by Orff, as performed by the San Francisco Symphony, the San Francisco Chorus. And you've just heard the final movements from the Grammy Award-winning recording of Carl Orff's Carmina Burana. Featured were soprano Lynn Dawson, tenor John Daniecki, Kevin McMillan, baritone, the San Francisco Girls Chorus, the San Francisco Boys Chorus, the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, and the San Francisco Symphony under the direction of Herbert Blumstedt. And it is my particular pleasure to have in the studio this morning the director of the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, Vance George. How was this, uh, I want to ask you one more question about this Carmine Burana. When you were recording it, I'm sure you didn't record it in sequential order. I, it's probably much like making a movie where you shoot maybe the end first and then the beginning and going back exactly and forth. Right. We did the opening movement uh, immediately followed by the, by the closing movement. And then we did start in and did it pretty much in sequence. Uh, and then went back and did uh, subsequent retakes if we felt that there was something that had gone wrong. But it was, uh, that, w that, was the, that was the general kind of uh, procedure. Um, yeah, Grammy winning. I, I did, it, it was, it was it, wonderful for us to win the Grammy in this particular season uh, because we're 20 years old this year. Right. And so it was a, it was a, uh, it's a really nice gift for the chorus to, uh, to have this... Uh, kind of honor and accolade happen in our in our 20th season. Right. And that 20th season is is to be celebrated with a concert next Sunday, right. Sunday afternoon, a special Mother's Day right. concert. Right. It's a it's a it's a double whammy. We have um, um celebrating Mother's Day and um, also our our big birthday party, 20th 20th birthday. Tell us about some of the works that you're going to perform. We're starting concert. out with uh, an arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner that I did uh, in the f for the for the opening of the hall. Our uh, hall was refurbished this fall, and um, the uh, the symphony wanted a, a an a cappella version, an unaccompanied version of the Star Spangled Banner because we begin every season with the Star Spangled Banner national anthem. So I did I did one for the chorus uh, in eight parts, and it's um, it's very grand and, um, and uh, full of lots of, of uh, what, very uh, exciting, um, uh, thick kinds of sounds that um, I think are appropriate to the Star Spangled Banner uh, or to, the, to a national anthem, uh, to the um, uh, quality of, of, of the, the national anthem. Um, then we do a mass by Anton Bruckner, it's uh, this, his uh, mass in E minor for 15 wind instruments and eight part chorus. I think it's his most beautiful mass. Um, then intermission, and then we follow the second half with uh, folk music. We have uh, folk, uh, um, Brahms uh, gypsy songs. Beautiful songs. Uh, Slovak yeah. 
folk songs by Bartok, and then some American folk songs. Um, we're doing um, a wonderful Appalachian hymn, Hark I Hear the Harps Eternal, um, Shenandoah, Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair, and Two Spirituals. Mm. And that is, once again, that is a concert on Mother's Day. Right. Uh, May, uh, Sunday, May the 9th at 3 o'clock in right. Davies Afternoon Hall, of course. Right. I'd like to turn now to this wonderful recording of works for chorus and orchestra by Johannes Brahms that came out uh, a couple of years ago. I'm very grateful to you for finally telling me how to pronounce the name of this one piece that's spelled <laughs> N-A with an umlaut N-I-E, and it's pronounced Nenya, as, right, as you Nenya, tell me, right. mm -hmm. which means elegy in German. Right. Tell us about this piece. It is a piece that I find uh, very typical of Brahms in that it uh, Brahms um, has a, a way of presenting a problem and then solving, helping you solve that problem or giving you a kind of a feeling of healing through just writing very beautiful music. I think it, for me it's uh, Brahms is a, re is a redemptive kind of composer. It's kind of like going to a it was the, it's the difference between <laughs> between going to a shrink and the shrink just stirs around and then you're left with, with the questions and the problems and mm -hmm. you have to go out and solve it on your own. Whereas Brahms tells you about the problems or you tell Brahms whatever and then you have the solution at the end. You feel as though, as though something has changed in you. I think that happens with live performances perhaps more than, than recorded performances. But um, I, th I think that music really does has has a, a healing effect and something like Nenya or the or the uh, the Alto Rhapsody, mm. uh, for instance, um, the Alto Rhapsody specifically because of, the, of its wonderful text in which this person is is uh, staggering through life and has these terrible things happening and and then the line comes, uh, Father, is th is there one line of of uh, healing that can be given to this this person? Um, in Nenya, um, the lines are, Even beauty must die. That which subdues men and gods does not move the steely heart of the Stygian Zeus. Only once did love touch the ruler of the underworld, and still upon the threshold sternly he recalled his gift. Aphrodite does not tend the lovely youth's wound, torn by the savage boar in his graceful body. The immortal m mother does not save the godly hero. When dying at the at the sea and gate, his destiny he fulfills. But she rises from the sea with all Nereus' daughters, and the lament for the exalted sun goes up. Behold, the gods weep, all the goddesses weep, that beauty must fade, that perfection must die. Even to be an elegy in the mouth of the beloved is glorious, for the ordinary goes down unsung to Orcus. So what does that all mean? <laughs> for me... Even to be an elegy in the mouth of the beloved is glorious. It has to do with with uh, with beauty and and love and this feeling that death must occur, and from that rises rises beauty. So it's uh, you know, we all face it. We'll see what Mr. Brahms has to say about it. Let's hear now Nenya by Johannes Brahms. This is the San Francisco Symphony Chorus under the direction of Vance George. This is a recording of works for chorus and orchestra by the San Francisco Symphony Chorus, directed by Vance George and the San Francisco Symphony under the direction of Herbert Blumstedt. And we're speaking this morning with Vance George. This is a CD of some very beautiful works by Johannes Brahms, and I'm surprised that the works aren't performed more often. The Alto Rhapsody is, of course, familiar to listeners, but uh, these other works are rarely ever done. Why is that? Well, I think it's just because they are they're very short, and so they don't really uh, program easily. I think you can group them and make a wonderful kind of, um, sort of like having a, um, a, um, an entree made of appetizers. And that's not maybe a good analogy, but anyway, short pieces that are um, rather expensive to produce because it takes a full chorus and a full orchestra. Mm -hmm. But when you they're very the, beautiful. When uh, you did them in concert, yeah. you put several of them together. Right, right? and there were other, then other works to complete the, to complete the concert. Right. 
I'd like to play one more of these works simply because they are so beautiful and, and they're not uh, that frequently played, either on the radio or, or in the concert hall. Yeah, this Gesang der Pazen is really an, a very, uh, is a rare piece. It's Opus 89, this Brahms' final work for chorus and orchestra, is it not? Song of the Fates. Hmm. And what should we know about this work? Um, <laughs> just that it's very beautiful. <laughs> I think just let the, spe the piece speak for itself. I wanted to also ask you about the production of Candide. I wasn't able to hear it myself, but I heard from people who did go to hear it that it was a great production. It was glorious. I think Candide is, is such a uh, s such a wonderful piece, and and uh, our concert version I think suited it absolutely perfectly because it it takes place in so many different uh, loci. I mean, it, it just goes all over the world. Uh, Cadiz, uh, you know, it just it's everywhere. And what our production did was to uh, offer your imagination uh, the uh, the unfolding, the blooming of the work, instead of being encumbered by scenic uh, design and that sort of thing. We just had the, uh, the occasional prop and the hero turning to the heroine and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so your mind took over and, and created everything rather like Our Town does in Thornton Wilder. You ask someone after seeing Our Town for the first time and they'll, they'll describe all kinds of scenery. And of course, there's nothing but a ladder and lighting. Uh, and a few chairs. So I think the same thing was true of Candide. I, it was for us a really glorious experience. I, I think one of the one of the real highlights in in my ten years of being uh, with the chorus, who is now twenty years old in their in their twentieth season, and I've been with them half of their life. And uh, I think this is really one of the one of the top top uh, performances in in my ten years. We're speaking with Vance George, director of the San Francisco Symphony Chorus. And before I let you go, I wonder if you would tell us about one final work that we're going to hear. This from a recording that you did uh, yeah. quite a few years ago. Yes, of, this uh, is in Norwegian. It's it's a uh, it's a hymn, um, and it's just it's a real short one. But uh, uh, it's it's the um, church folk, and they are uh, singing this uh, morning hymn. Um, that's a, a scene in which uh, you hear the you hear the the this hymn uh, coming from the from the church. Okay, Vince George, <coughs> thank you very much for coming down and thank talking you. It's been a pleasure. Morning. Enjoyed it.